Caregiving. It's a subject that is discussed often today as working parents require daycare for their children. Aging adults require assistance in daily living. We have professionalized caregiving and at the same time we read reports on the economic impact of non-professionalized care within families. It seems like caregiving can always come down to money, which is one reason I wanted to look at caregiving through the Franciscan tradition in order to decentralize the role of money in my understanding of care, both the giving of care and the receiving of care. Now, the subject of illness and mental health have been raised and continue to be raised in Franciscan studies. Uh, Donna Trembinsky's recent book, Illness and Authority, Disability in the Life and Lives of Francis of Assisi, is a book I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in the subject through the lens of illness itself. But I want to look more directly at caregiving, since it percolates to the surface in many texts as a central tenet of Franciscan spiritual practices. And yet at the same time, it's really easy to overlook caregiving as a central tenet of Franciscan spiritual practice. So tonight I'm going to offer a few explanations for why it's so easy to overlook this from the tradition that has been handed down. And I do so with the hope and intention to redirect our focus to the original practices of mutual care found among Francis and Claire. But I also wanna focus on the lesser known practitioners of the tradition. And those of you who know my work, you won't be surprised. I wanna focus on the lay women and men who gave themselves as caregivers, both to their family and to strangers, but whose stories have been edited uh, because of the purposes for which they were written and have therefore been forgotten or reimagined in ways that have contorted the spiritual resonance of their caregiving relationships. 40 minutes goes by really quickly, so I'll necessarily have to give just a few examples and I'm going to gloss over some background evidence um, and scholarly conversance uh, just to move things along. So what is caregiving? If we look it up in a definition, this is what we're going to find in our current uh, dictionaries found in the United States. The activity or profession of regularly looking after a child or a sick, elderly, or disabled person or relating to that activity or profession of looking after a child, sick, elderly, or disabled person. Um, I actually really like what Rosalind Carter had to say to help us start exploring how to amplify this definition of caregiving. There are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Caregiving is universal, she says. Caregiving is universal, and so I wonder if our understanding of caregiving can be amplified, can be um, broadened to include a more comprehensive understanding of what it is to give care and receive care. So with that definition from the dictionary in mind and with this prospect of broadening our definition of caregiving. Let's just take a look at this image. And just for a moment, what do you see here? Take, you know, just think internally to yourself. Is this an image of caregiving? And who is the caregiver? And who is the care recipient? We've been prompted by the de dictionary definition to assume that perhaps the woman who is slightly hunched over and with gray, gray hair, perhaps she's the care receiver and the younger person, taller person holding her is the caregiver. Is it possible that they are sharing the role of caregiver and care receiver? Just wonder in this image of a master gardener, we see a man carefully tending plants. Is it possible that he is also receiving care from the plants that he's tending? 
Is he receiving joy? Is he receiving a sense of um, livelihood, of worth? Is the care going both ways? Is it a mutual encounter? This is what I'd like to share in terms of Franciscan understandings of care. I think we, all of us who are here, probably understand that Franciscan spirituality is one of relationality. Implicit in that is mutual care, care that is both given and received in the same encounter. I'm going to start off with a couple comments from the rules of uh, Francis and Claire, and I'm doing so in large part because I'm always asked about the rules. So the early rule from uh, that Francis wrote in chapter 10, he writes, if any of the brothers fall sick, wherever he may be, let the other brothers not leave him. Don't leave him behind. You gotta, you gotta help him. At least one of you has to stay with him and take care of him, maybe more. And then he also, in this early rule, adds something for the brother who is sick. I beg the sick brothers to thank God for everything and to desire to be whatever the Lord wills, whether sick or well. So there's, there's a responsibility of the sick brother also to act in a certain way. Now, as we know in the later rules, some of the language gets edited out through the eyes and the lens of canonists who edited some language down and amplified other language. So we know that in chapter six of the later rule, it's pretty simply written, when any brother falls sick, the other brothers must serve him as they wish to be served. But this is prefaced by really interesting familiar language. Language, Wherever the brothers may be and meet one another, let them show that they are members of the same family. Let each one confidently make known his need to the other. For if a mother loves and cares for her son, according to the flesh, how much more diligently must someone love and care for his brother according to the spirit? What I find so interesting is that let each one confidently make known his need. There's no need to back down from one's need. Make it known. Make known what you are in need of. And in the rule for hermitages, I, I've always loved this uh, passage, which is found in many rules for local communities. Uh, I first encountered it when I was in the, the Vatican archives and I found like a 17th century document from Naples talking about the mamma in, in the convent. And I was thinking, who is the mamma? Well, the mamma is one of the friars. Let those who wish to stay in hermitages in a religious way be three brothers or at most four, let two of these be the mother, the mamma, and have two the sons. Let two who are the mothers keep the life of Martha and two the sons, the life of Mary. So clearly Mary is to, the, the two sons who are to be Mary are to live the contemptible life. The Martha, the ones who are the mothers, the Martha lifestyle, are to take care of the others. They are the caregivers. And this mother imagery is really important. That would take a whole nother lecture. So just note that it's there. Uh, much of this language is taken up by Claire and I'm not gonna go much into this. We know that Claire and her sisters took care of one another, but in terms of the rule itself, the language is pretty much taken from the later rule of, of, um, of Francis. Now, I actually usually just don't prefer to include prescriptive sources like these. Um, in large part because I don't know how much they really tell us about the lived experience of faith. Rules are about the shoulds, um, but not necessarily about how life is lived, how uh, spirituality is experienced. And I'd like to use the example of Francis and the leper as a case in point. Um, we, it's a very well-known, uh, very well-known story. We know that, um, Francis has said in his rule that the brothers should accept anything that comes their way, that they should be good patients. We also know that Francis himself was not a very good patient many times. He refused care usually, and he could be petulant and grumpy, and he always took it out on his brothers. 
So that's one reason why I don't necessarily always like to look at the rules. The lived experience is different. And now I'll turn to the story of, of the leper because I think we find here this really interesting uh, grappling with discomfort and grappling with what, what is. It's not at all an idealizing version of Francis if we read this, the texts. Um, it's a well-known story, but warrants our careful attention and deep reflection into the process by which Francis encounters lepers. And we, and we generally see in the images of him, uh, Francis on the other side of his conversion. Here he is holding the leper close to him, the leper definitely feeling ease falling into the support of Francis. But Shalana writes uh, with some detail more about this, uh, this encounter and about this conversion. Francis, not caring that he was despised by others, he moved to, to be with the lepers. He served them devotedly by humbly washing their sores, not even shrinking from wiping away the pus. Previously, such things were so disgusting to him that he used to hold his nose, not only when he saw lepers themselves nearby, but even near, um, even when their home spread a distance. But the Lord visited him with grace and Francis conquered himself and straight away went up and kissed them. This spiritual transformation that Francis experienced required God, no doubt, but it also required an internal shift in perspective within Francis. And here I find the work of Rachel Naomi Raymond really helpful. Some of you may have heard me talk about this distinction that she makes and between helping, fixing, and serving is extremely helpful in our pastoral care today that we offer people and that we experience. Um, and I think it helps amplify and explain Francis's own situation with the leper. Raymond writes, fixing and helping create a distance between people but we cannot serve at a distance. We can only serve that to which we are profoundly connected. Helping, fixing, and serving represent three different ways of seeing life. When you help, you see life as weak. When you fix, you see life as broken. When you serve, you see life as whole. Fixing and helping may be the work of the ego and service the work of the soul. Service rests on the premise that the nature of life is sacred, that life is a holy mystery, which has an unknown purpose. When we serve, we know that we belong to life and to that sacred purpose. From the perspective of service, we are all connected. All suffering is like my suffering and all joy is like my joy. The impulse to serve emerges naturally and inevitably from this way of seeing. Serving is different from helping. Helping is not a relationship of equals. A helper may see others as weaker than they are, needier than they are. And people often feel that inequality. The danger in helping is that we may inadvertently take away from people more than we could ever give them. We may diminish their self-esteem, their sense of worth, integrity, and even wholeness. So you can see in this chart some of the distinctions that she has made in, in her prose, helping you see people as weak and needing assistance. When we cling on to helping others, burnout is really high. We can cause people to feel inept when we go in and help. Fixing, we see people as broken and it's up to us to fix it. The fixer believes that there's only one way of doing things and it's their way. But serving, you lead with the imperfection, with personality. You integrate the person's experiences and this really is a relationship of equals. So when we think about Francis and the leper, what does this suddenly look like? Well, I think it looks very different. I think 
we see in this image Francis and the leper really looking at each other, encountering one another, seeing one another. And most of all, allowing oneself to be deeply affected by the encounter. This doesn't really come through exactly that way in the texts, but using a hermeneutic of empathy, using this lived experience, this empathic way of reading into the text, I think one can find that there is this internal shift in Francis, that he is affected by the leper, his encounter with the leper, as much as the leper's encounter is, is affected by him. So I wonder if there are other ways of looking at this, this definition of care and caregiving. And of course there are beyond the dictionary. And here I'll, I'll move rather quickly, uh, but there's important work by Joan Tronto in her book called Mo Moral Boundaries, which I'm thankful for David Couturier to uh, bring to my attention. In, in this book and in her uh, many articles and respondents to her work, uh, these are some of the things I'd like to pull out. First of all, that care really denotes this, this level of some level of engagement. There's an interaction. Care implies reaching out to something other than oneself. It's not self-referring or self-absorbing. And care necessarily leads to action. And I think that's a really important uh, point to make. It leads to some kind of action. And really care consumes much of human activity, much like Rosalind Carter said, care is all around us, but we might not always recognize it as care. She makes a couple further distinctions that I think are important for us to keep in mind as we look at the lay examples that I'll get to very quick, uh, quickly. She says there are four phases of care. There's caring about, which involves there's a recognition that care is needed and determining a way to meet that need. Uh, you know, what we care about really defines us as people. So it's important to become quite aware of what you care about, have it more than being an intuitive care, but also making an assessment on how to meet a need. That, de that involves deliberate cognition, deliberate discernment. Taking care of involves assuming responsibility for the identified need of, of care. Um, if one feels that you cannot uh, take care of the need, there is no taking care of. You know, if you think a problem is just so big, you feel helpless, then you're not taking care of it. This stage necessarily involves a sense of agency and responsibility. Tronto says these first two levels often uh, involve public roles and duties of, and they are the duties of the powerful. And she often associates these with men. Although when we get to the examples of lay Franciscans, we'll see very powerful women taking these roles on. Caregiving is very different. This phrase that we've been using from the very beginning of this, this presentation involves direct action of meeting the need of care. It's the work itself. It's not giving money to a cause because money is not direct giving care, it's, it's indirect. So it's the caregiving is the actual work involved in giving the care. And this is often overlooked in our contemporary society, it's often undervalued in our contemporary society, and it is usually overlooked in the historical sources. So this is one of the reasons we often don't uh, take seriously uh, the role of caregiving in our Franciscan tradition, because you really have to tease it out to get to the full picture of giving care and receiving care. Finally, this last stage of receiving care, the rece reception of care can be complex and misunderstood by well-intentioned people as something that should be natural and obvious. People should want to be cared for, right? Well, we may not always understand the differences in cultural expectations or personal, psychological, and spiritual states that get in the way of receiving care. So the reception of care is itself its own um, complex phase. Finally, I would add to this mix what Raymond has, has brought to our attention, and that is the potential for mutual care receiving. 
if we live in a Franciscan way of, of caregiving, it's not just one way, it's both and. So now let's get to the lay Franciscans that I've been eager to talk about. Elizabeth of Hungary, whose feast day is later this month, is one of the first lay Franciscans associated with the Friars Minor. She was born in 1207, died in 1231. She was a princess, so you'll often see her depicted here on the left in a prayer card, on the right in an icon in royal clothing, um, really asserting some royal authority in their, her comportment. Um, she was surrounded by affluence, power, and perhaps most importantly, expectations of others of what proper comportment for her was. Her life of charity made her very popular. And so she, upon her death, she was almost immediately considered for canonization because so many people came forward with stories about her. Her confessor, Conrad of Magdeburg, um, compiled a catalog of these, these testified miracles. And he also wrote a short vita or life of her to preface uh, the catalog. And he sent this on to Pope Gregory the Ninth. In it, he wrote a rather telling uh, paragraph about her caregiving. In that town, she built a kind of hospital, taking in the sick and the weak. She placed the most miserable and contemptible people at her table. Notice his language, they're so much full of judgment. Most miserable and contemptible people at her table. And when I reprimanded her about it, she responded that she received from them a singular grace and humility. Like a prudent woman, which she most certainly was, she called my attention to the life that she lived before, saying that it was necessary for her to cure one extreme with its opposite in just this manner. Elizabeth gathered to herself, among others, a paralyzed boy who had been deprived of his father and mother and who struggled with a constant flow of blood. And she put him each night in her bed for the sake of her own spiritual training. After the boy died, she took on without my knowledge a care of a leprous girl and hid her in her own quarters taking upon every duty dictated by humility. She humbled herself by feeding her, laying her down, washing her, and even removing her shoes, imploring the other members of the household not to be offended by such things. When I discovered this, I punished her severely. May the Lord forgive me, because I feared that she would be infected by the contact with the girl. After I had sent away the leper and then left to preach in a far off place, she took in a poor boy who was so mangy that he did not have a single hair on his head. Her intent was to cure him and indeed by bathing and treating him from whom she learned all of this I don't know, she succeeded in curing him and this boy was seated by her bedside when she died. in a collection of depositions taken a few years later in 1235 as part of the canonization process. We also know that she sewed clothes for poor catechumens and she participated in their baptism, removing them from the font so that she would become their godmother. She made clothes and burial shrouds for dead paupers. And the deposition specifically noted that she touched and handled the dead herself and attended their funerals. The examples of her actions go on, but I'd like to call attention to just a few elements. First, the care that Elizabeth offered was returned to her, as is evidenced by the boy whom she served and who in turn served her as she was dying. This mutuality of care is also evidenced in her own deep awareness what she gained from serving the poor, which she shared with her confessor, Conrad. Her caregiving was not a self-centered act of charity. It was not a function of her queenly or princess office, no. It was a way of deepening her faith through encounters with the poor, the ill, the dying, and the dead. Notable and perhaps not unusual is the pushback she got from her confessor who reprimanded her who beat her for her presence with the poor. He deemed it inappropriate and dangerous. 
Let's just take a look at some of the images that are used to depict Elizabeth of Hungary. And actually, before I um, move the, the slides forward, if you have an image of her in your mind, just take note of what she might look like in your mind, having heard just this story. Here we have an image of her giving alms. We might use Tronto's language she cared about and she took care of the poor by giving alms. Notice that um, she's not looking directly into the faces of the poor in this image. She's giving money to um, a pauper on the street. Here's a, a very well-known image of her giving bread to someone, again, not mutual eye contact is made, but in this, in this case, it seems like the poor person receiving bread might feel some shame or humility in receiving this, this food from the princess. Caring for the ill requires even a closer proximity, right? And we have the eye contact made in this 14th century glass of, um, Elizabeth helping someone ill in bed. And finally, here we have an image, one of the very few images where the heads of the ill person and Elizabeth are close together. There's perhaps eye contact being made, I'm not sure, but a little less hierarchical um, depiction of Elizabeth and the people she's serving. I think that's really important for us to start taking notice of the images that are surrounding us in the books that we read, the books that we pray with, the images that we have in our churches. How is caregiving depicted and how do we take on um, assumptions about caregiving based on these images? And can we start perhaps commissioning new images or can we work with the images that we have in a critical analytical way? Um, Jacoba de Setesoli, Jacoba de Setesoli is one of my favorite lay Franciscan women, as many of you know. She was an aristocratic woman of both great wealth and great authority, widowed at a very young age, but she defied all of the pressure around her coming from her family of origin to remarry. As a widow in Rome, she met Francis around the year 1212. And despite being attracted by his, all of his teachings and his persona, she never divested her wealth. Instead, she used her wealth as a form of uh, taking care of others. We often forget her, many people forget her today, um, but she is remembered in Rome. There's a street named after her. You can find it, um, San Francesco Aripa, the church that she gave to the friars uh, is on the street named after her. She was a great benefactor of Francis and the friars. So she cared about and took care of the friars using Tronto's language. She was probably one of the most important benefactors for the building of San Francesco, according to Andre Gaucher. But she was also a caregiver to Francis. And this image on the right is a fresco from the lower Basilica of San Francesco, depicting her as carrying all the things that would be needed to bury Francis as she intuited that he was dying and would come to her, come to him as he was dying. But this is a, an account that I, I have written about and I will only briefly now talk about, especially because of time but we haven't really fleshed out all of the kinds of caregiving that Jacoba likely gave Francis as he was dying, in part because there are only five accounts that bring her to his deathbed. And in these five accounts, what would be a very natural way of caregiving for a woman to offer anyone in the Middle Ages, anyone who is dying, the kind of washing, the kind of, um, comforting with cool compresses, the offering of cool drinks of water, rubbing of, of feet, holding of hands, praying gently. None of this is in the text that we have. Instead, the texts that bring us this depiction of Jacoba at the bedside of Francis 
really make it into a miracle story. Jacoba becomes a Mary Magdalene to Francis's altar Christus, another Christ. And it becomes a miraculous event, spiritual event, rather than a very natural caregiving event. So the few images that we have here in the lower Basilica of San Francesco and a few pieces of texts where we know that her contemporaries were aware that she brought material things for the funeral of Francis. That's the shroud that she's carrying in that fresco, candles, incense, a pillow to comfort him as he was dying. We know she came prepared to care for him. It's just that this, there's a great discomfort about the notion of her taking care of Francis. This discomfort has been translated through the centuries. And I'll, I'll just quote one story from the 18th century. Two Bolandist scholars, scholars who were editing texts, just found it outrageous to think that Jacoba would be at the bedside of Francis. We think, they said, we think that she never served the holy man at his bedside when he was sick and finally we consider it that is the notion that she was at his bed, unworthy and shameful. That it is held that while necessity forced it, while no serious and just cause demanded it, the very holy man suffering at the end went to his, holy, his death, wholly naked and lying on the earth before the face and the eyes of Jacoba. This we reject as absurd, they said. The Bolandists were following the practices of several centuries to suppress the notion of the slave woman tending to Francis as inappropriate and scandalous. We actually have to find more folksy language, um, thanks to Sister Mary McKee in a book about uh, Francis as a mis misfit. She said, Jacoba was definitely at the bedside of Francis. Jacoba took over, she writes. Men are not much use at the deathbed. It was up to Brother Jack. She washed what had to be washed, tidied up the hut. Then she came back to Francis, bathed his battered face. She eased the pain-wracked limbs, reverently tended the wounds, wounded hands and feet. Brother Jack stayed and cared for Francis until the end." Unquote. Now, such folksy description of the work that Francis or that Jacoba may have done at the bedside is usually overlooked by scholars. But McGee's assumptions about Jacoba's role in Francis's final days point to a realistic acceptance of the role of women that generally uh, caused embarrassment and even alarm to most interpreters of the scene to date. Here we have a painting done by a, a male of secular Franciscan and you can see there's really quite a an awareness in more recent years of the caregiving that, that Jacoba offered Francis. And here is an early 20th century painting done by a Benedictine is showing Jacoba with other friars and she is holding his feet. So I think there are modern sensibilities and openness to an awareness of the caregiving that Jacoba would have offered Francis. And it's really time for us to um, commission more images of this and make sure that the, there is this awareness of this kind of spiritual caregiving in the tradition. Peter the comb maker is yet another uh, caregiver and yet in a different way. He has many more areas of care and service, which I will summarize rather briefly. Um, I want to start off by offering though a quote that we know about. He was a spiritual director to a Franciscan friar. And he has said, uh, Peter is said to have told the friar, you know, often our Lord holds back consolation until a more favorable time. It's not profitable for us to be consoled. Sometimes we do better to have to wait for it than to receive it. In this way, weariness becomes a source of precious grace. I don't know what the Franciscan friar confessed or told Peter, but this is the counsel that we know has been written down that he gave. And imagine the kind of care 
authenticity and vulnerability for a medieval Franciscan friar to turn to a layman for counsel, spiritual counsel and advice. Um, he, Peter was a great trusted man. And I'm having to pass through several pages here. A biography of Peter was written uh, 40 years after his death. So quite a, quite a long time after he died. But I think it's important to see how he was depicted in that Vita. It was commissioned by the city of Siena, first of all. And the most important aspect of the Vita is that Peter was present, fully present and fully engaged in many different situations. He was present in the workplace where he crafted his combs with care and he offered always a fair price. He was present in his marriage and this is really most unusual for a medieval, medieval example. We know that he was, he felt it was important to be mindful to be home for meals. He took great care of his wife and he was aware how important his domestic relationship was. So he did not, not want to take on mm, too many spiritual practices at church. He said, no, my role is at home. When he died, he did take on more caregiving roles in his city and in his church. He was present in the city government to mediate peace processes and to mediate between factions. He cared for the ill in the hospitals. And these examples are rather um, generally described, but we know that he bathed patients and he cared for them, even and um, cared for them amidst, amid their putrid mess is the, the text, what the text says. He was present with his affiliation with Franciscan friars and Dominican friars but he insisted that he did not want to join either of them. He felt that his vocation was as a layman. He founded an intentional community and was present with the other men who were part of this com community. And he was present in his, his business dealings. It's equally noteworthy and revealed by the authors that his presence was noticed by all of these groups in Siena and was received as beneficial and worthy of holding up as a model of civic participation and even sanctity. What's important also in this hagiography is that he's not a miracle worker, although he does, he does cure one toothache of a friar, that's true, but he doesn't have a lot of miracles attributed to him. What is attributed to him is gentle speech, constant presence, and working through his caregiving to all of these different constituencies. And you'll notice how he's depicted with a finger to his mouth. And this really points to how he worked with his faith. He was aware that as a young man, he spoke in a volatile way and he wanted to rectify that. So he was always very concerned about his way of speech and his pattern of speech. And he brought forward a way of deep listening into all of his caregiving. Final examples, I'll just give briefly and together. You've heard me talk about Margaret of Cortona and Angela of Foligno before, but in the past, I've really focused on their spiritual leadership. But in this case, I'd like to just bring forward that in addition to their being physical caregivers, Margaret was a midwife, Angela worked as a volunteer in a leper hospice. I think that their role as counselors and truth tellers to the friars is a form of caregiving. I think that they must have felt close enough to the friars and cared enough about them to give them advice like, don't follow, don't, don't buy all the fawners, those people who fawn all over you after you preach, don't buy it. It's not worth it. It's only out of care that they gave this kind of advice to the friars, I think. So to conclude, caregiving in the Franciscan tradition is not a mere transaction of service. Care involves relational give and take, which often includes mutual transformation. Caregivers, as well as those whom Joan Tronto would label as those who, who care about or take care of others, do so not to spotlight their own contributions, but instead to grow in faith.
modeled by Francis and Claire in their shared and respective practice of care with their immediate companions. This form of caregiving, which is anchored in trust that allows for vulnerability, where conversions of faith begin and mature, this kind of caregiving was countercultural in the 13th century, which is one reason why so many of the details of this practice of care are not documented, but we must fill in when we read these stories. And perhaps it remains countercultural today, which is why so much care has become professionalized. Care is hard work. And I think this tradition that we share can be made more authentically incarnational with additions of memoirs, art, poetry, and the like, fleshing out the gritty details of care, not to shock, but to be of support to those who do the hard work of giving and receiving care even today. Thank you so much, Dr. Darlene Prides for your lecture. Uh, we've certainly learned a lot. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department, and let's together give a collective round of applause to Dr. Price.